Mellifugidae is the family name for the group of birds that in Australia we know as the honey eaters. In this family there are close to 200 species. Firstly we will do a quick slideshow of the honey eaters commonly seen in Australia. Honey eaters are usually found in groups, grazing in the canopy, feeding on nectar and gleaning from the leaves. They protect this food supply and are aggressive towards any other poaching bird groups, whether it be the same species or another. Notice the variation in colour, size, bill structure and this reflects the varied environment in which some of these honey eaters live. As a family, what they do share is the common food source, nectar. They also eat invertebrates, arachnids, insects and their larvae. There is a variation in the diet. Some honey eaters are more biased towards insects and some prefer a more nectiferous diet. With the subtitles, I have given the genus name, then the common name, Other birds live on the Australian eucalypt flower, the lorikeets and the zosterops or silver eye. And the common feature of all these nectiferous birds is a feathered tongue. We can't see the feathering tongue on this brown honey eater as it projects, but with magnification it is there. The taxonomy of the honey eaters has been rather confusing, but now with DNA hybridisation, we can get a better look at the relationships amongst the honey eaters, and they are fairly closely related to the partilotes. In this video, I'm concentrating on the honey eaters. I will leave the partilotes, chats, and miners for other videos. Most honey eaters are found in Australia, but there are quite a few species in Papua and Oceania. I can well remember in the 90s going to Hawaii where I spent a year, hoping for the ultimate birding experience in finding some of the rare near extinct honey eaters of Hawaii. I was ever hopeful. Alas, I found no honey eaters from the Eastern Pacific. Unfortunately, due to Captain Cook bringing mosquito laden water to Hawaii on his voyages, avian malaria had caused a mass extinction. But with DNA studies, we find that these birds are distant relatives and not honey eaters. As far as the honey eaters going west, they have gone up to Papua New Guinea and into eastern Indonesia, but have not crossed the Wallace line. The bill of the honey eaters varies quite a lot. Here this Lewins has a fairly short, stubby, solid bill, yet it is eating from flowers. All honey eaters have a long tongue, but when they go to retract the bill from the narrow flower, the tongue gets compressed, and so the large-billed birds aren't very good at eating nectar from narrow flowers. However, the eucalypt flower is the main flower on which these birds survive, and the eucalypt flower is an open flower. The fine-billed honey eaters are more specialised in their nectivorous habits. The fine bill and long tongue in combination allow them to eat from long narrow flowers like grevillea, mistletoe, eremophila. Here in the Kimberley is a honey eater eating from a bloodwood, a eucalypt with an open flower. Note the bird is largely brown and white, but when you see yellow on the white, it usually suggests immaturity. And this is an immature, banded honey eater. Again, a Lewin's honey eater on a grevillea. This is a long, narrow flower. Not ideal for the Lewin's with a broader bill. He didn't waste too much time. In the canopy of the northern tablelands of New South Wales, a lot of bird chatter. And this is a group of honey eaters flittering about. They spend a lot of time chasing one another and doing random movements. In fact, their feeding time is minimal. They seem to spend more time chasing one another or playing like these Fuscus honey eaters on a dead post. The best place to see groups of honey eaters is when they come to drink. And here in the coastal ranges of New South Wales, we have white-cheeked honey eaters and New Holland honey eaters. Both have a very similar feeding pattern, a similar bill, and here at the water pond, they get along quite well. However, when it comes to protecting the nectar, they can be most aggressive to one another. 
Some honey eaters, like this stripy honey eater, go in smaller groups or pairs, and so they don't socially adjust as well and are far more aggressive, even to their own. Here, Fuscus and yellow tufted honey eaters get on well with one another at a watering point in the northern tablelands of New South Wales. In contrast, this white naked honey eater will not allow any other birds to come near the watering point where he is standing, waiting to go down for a drink. Again with the striped honey eater, I find it very difficult to interpret their behaviour. Certainly it looks aggressive, but I'm uncertain. But still suspect that some of the birds, like the striped honey eater, prefer self-solitude rather than the chasing exhibited by honey eaters that are far more flock orientated. Here now we have a black honey eater. Look at that beautiful fine bill, perfect for getting into fine flowers, and that beautiful black head, and that bill is made for Eremophila, mistletoe, grevillea. There he goes, straight into the mistletoe. The black honey eater is a sexually dimorphic bird. That is, the morphology of the male and the female is different. And the smaller honey eaters with a fine bill are the most likely to be dimorphic. Here in the Northern Territory, look at that beautiful golden back on this honey eater. And if we look under the chin of this bird, it has a little black mark. This is a black chinned honey eater. Look at that lunar marking over the top of the eye. It's green. Now a shift with drop in latitude over to New South Wales. And here is another black chinned honey eater. But the lunate marking above the eye is not green, but blue. Both of these birds are the same species. I don't want to talk a lot about subspecies. I will do this when we cover individual birds. But you can see the variation amongst the honey eaters, a taxonomist's nightmare. Honey eaters show this wing shimmer, and I suspect it's given in the presence of a more dominant bird. There's that Lewin's honey eater again, still trying to get into the grevillea. Now the Lewin's honey eater belongs to the genus Malophagia. And in this genus, there are several birds that are very similar. There are three of them which have triangular yellow ear coverts. The first is the Lewin's honey eater, then below that in the insert, the spotted honey eater, and below that is the graceful honey eater. Now these three birds are all separate species within the same genus. At the bottom of this grass tree flower, there are two honey eaters. On the right, there is a graceful honey eater. This looks very much like a Lewin's but the bill is finer and the eye is dark, whereas if we go back to a Lewin's, we can notice that the iris is blue. And at the top of the grass tree flower, there is another one that again looks like a Lewin's, but the gape goes behind the eye and the eye is again dark and the bill is heavier. So this is a spotted honey eater. So three birds, one genus, three species, in contrast to the black chinned honey eater, where we had two very, very similar birds, except for the lunar marking over the eye, yet both of these birds were of the same species. This is another honey eater. It is a fryer bird, a little fryer bird. Fryer birds or leatherheads are characterized by the minimal amount of feathers on the head, giving them a fryer look. And the genus name for the group is Philemon. But look at this one, it has yellow on the throat. Fryer birds characteristically have variations in the shade of fawn. Darker fawn and then pale fawn. Never yellow. Here now is the classical adult fryer bird. No yellow. So the previous bird has the yellow markings of a young bird. This demonstrates the change in appearance of honey eaters with age. This bird was photographed on the northern tablelands in New South Wales. Look at it, a beautiful fawn coloration, white around the neck, a friar look with no feathers on the head, and the head is black. And look at that beautiful knob on the bill. This is the noisy friar bird, the classical photograph of this species. Now another bird with a knob on the bill, fawn, 
But look at all that white. It looks like a fryer bird, a noisy fryer bird, but all that white is confusing. Maybe leucistic, where the colours don't combine with the keratin. The clue to this bird is on the frilly feathers of the throat. Look, there is just a touch of yellow. So it is not leucistic, and like the little fryer bird, this suggests that this bird is an immature, noisy fryer bird. So when you find a honey eater with unusual coloration, look for yellow. This may suggest that it's an immature bird if it is present. But be careful, for many adult honey eaters have yellow. Another example of changes in coloration in morphology with age. Here the bird on the right has more yellow than green. And this is an immature western white-naped honey eater. And so the bird on the right is immature. Well, we've looked at morphology changes with age. What about changes with sex? And as mentioned, this is sexual dimorphism. And sexual dimorphism is more present in the smaller, finer-billed honey eaters. The red honey eaters, the black honey eaters, and the spine bills. Again, with the black honey eater, look at the difference between the male and the female. The female has no black. The same is for the red honey eaters. Here is a scarlet, and look at the female. Just a blush of rouge over the face. Minimal red. And the spine bill, where the female colours are duller and the head is grey and not black like the male. These small honey eaters in a way can be compared to the hummingbirds of the Americas. Both are addicted to sugar and hummingbirds of a comparative size to the honey eaters of Australia have a similar wing beat rate. But their physiology is different, in particular the way they suck up nectar. Hummingbirds have a split tongue whereas the honey eaters have a feathered tongue. But the smaller honey eaters can hover, but not in a sustainable way. And it is rather awkward and clumsy compared to the beauty of a hummingbird. The spinebill, for instance, can get a wing beat of up to 15 beats per second. The same as hummingbirds of equivalent size. However, as mentioned, the honey eater cannot sustain this rapid wing beat. The genus name for the red honey eaters is Mysomela, and the dusky honey eater belongs to this genus. The dusky honey eater, as its name suggests, is more of a dusky red than a true scarlet. But like the other small honey eaters, this bird is capable of hovering. When searching for honey eaters in the Australian bush, the best way to find them is by locating flowering blossom of eucalypts. Flowering of eucalypts can be erratic because of seasonal conditions. When there's no blossom, the honey eaters do look for mistletoe. Here is the yellow tufted honey eater eating on the mistletoe. When not feeding on the blossom, the honey eaters will go and glean from the tree, looking for insects and arachnids. One particular insect they like is the lerp. This is a little sapsucker, pulling out carbohydrates from the tree, making a little sugary nest around itself. Larger honey eaters with a large bill not only glean, they will also go onto the trunk and branches of the tree looking for loose bark because this is where spiders will breed. And as they pick up the bark, they hopefully can find a tasty arachnid morsel. Watch this blue faced honey eater as he goes along the branches. See how he forages under the bark. As the honey eater chicks develop, so the increased need for protein and minerals. In the Australian bush, there is an abundance of carbohydrates, but a shortage of essential minerals. So you will see a honey eater chase insects, expending enormous amounts of energy just to keep up a nutrient supply of minerals. In this slow motion clip, there is not much to see, but if you look above the she oaks, 
you will see little dots going by in their hundreds. These are honey eaters, yellow faced and white naped mostly, heading north in autumn on a latitudinal migration. The reason for this is uncertain. They fly in a very determined manner, as though frenzied. And though it is usually north, occasionally you will see the flock heading in a westerly direction. It doesn't appear to be related to food, for the flock can fly over blossom without stopping to feed. So it appears to be within their biological clock that some honey eaters migrate en masse. The interesting thing, it is always associated with the migration of silver eyes. And silver eyes feed in groups and have a combined group intelligent. It is possible that the honey eaters are just following the silver eye. When filming at water points along these migratory paths, the number of honey eaters and silver eyes coming in for a drink increases dramatically. But the honey eaters in particular will not stop to feed on blossom. The silver eyes do have short stops. On behalf of Plumes of Oz, thank you for watching this video. We hope you have enjoyed it. And if you would like to subscribe, just click on the P for Plumes of Oz. And you will get automatic notification of our next release of the Birds in the Wild of Australia.